Hey, what's up, guys? I hope you're enjoying the Be The Difference podcast. If you are, I got a huge favor to ask. Go on to Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star review for us. It helps us immensely with algorithms and growth because we grow completely by word of mouth organically. That's why there are no ads. Also, feel free to share this content with somebody you think might get value out of it. Last, if you don't know, I also do coaching to help people become the best version of themselves, starting with physical fitness, going all the way through mindset, sales, and leadership. If you're interested in learning more, there's going to be a link in the in the description of the podcast. You can schedule a time. It's a free assessment. All I'm going to do is have a conversation with you and see if I can even help you. I look forward to speaking to all of you. Continue to enjoy the podcast and remember to always be the difference. What's up, everybody? It's Greg with Delta, and this is the Be The Difference podcast. This podcast is all about making you a better person in your life and in your business with coaching on sales, leadership, mindset, marketing, everything under the sun when it comes to being an entrepreneur. We bring on guest speakers. Today, I've got the honor and pleasure of welcoming Mr. Joe Rocky. Joe, what's going on, yeah, man? Thank you for having me. I, I'm very excited to be a part of this. You know, I'm, I'm excited. Some our, our, yeah, thank you. Some, some of our backstory overlaps here, right? You know, I, when I first came out of school, I basically knew that I had skills that mattered. And that was my thing going into college. You get paid for skills, not for theories. So what are some skills that every company needs, right? They need to know where their money is. That's basically what accounting is. They need to know how to get more money. That's essentially fine. But most of all, and the most important thing, they need to know how to get revenue. And that's what every single one of my jobs was throughout school and really throughout my entire life. And as I was coming out of college, the last recession, boom, turned right on. So I'm looking at people in my class that were accepted to the elite and the elite of the elite financial houses um, and all the accounting firms just to see the offers coming off the table. And it's like, ooh, um, what am I going to do now? So... I ended up falling into the one industry, the one place that will hire anyone that can pass a test. I became a financial advisor, everybody, right in the heart of a recession. It was awesome. That being said, I was successful at it. The first year I was rookie of the year, second year I was underclassman of the year, and the third year I left. Um, and ultimately the reason I left was because I became uncomfortable for two main reasons of where I was at. The first was I created and what I always wanted was the ability to get paid when I'm older for work that I did when I was younger. The insurance world calls that residuals, but that's the core concept. And the place I was at, and I'm really upset it took me three years to learn this, was paying a residual rate of 0.1%. In English, that means I'd have to work for 1,000 years to make up one year salary. And that was not the goal I was trying to strive for. The other thing that didn't set well with me at all was as they were coming out of the recession, the products they were selling were less good. There's just no other way to say that. And I really wanted control over my product. I didn't like the fact that they cared more about protecting their own self than helping the client. And that didn't sit well with me. I started my first business with the sole aim of let's make an awesome product that I didn't know how to make. And as a result, that first one, you know, it's successful. I mean, it, the business is successful, but that first house, which is what I did, I, I, going in that mantra, I wanted to become residual income. And at the time, it wasn't like now where we constantly sign up for subscription-based products and we don't think anything about it. Netflix, Hulu, our subscription site here, we don't think about it. It's, it's normal. 2011? Nope. You only paid subscription costs for utilities, taxes, and rent. That was it. And look how far the world has come in just 11 years. But I had to become a landlord. But every single bank on the planet hated landlords. So I had to do this flipping thing. And I can't even tell you all the ways I did this wrong. Like, dude. Um, so... I was coming from the financial world. I was selling to lawyers, doctors, and surgeons. You know, people who, when they say they're going to do something, they do it, and they do it really well. 
And when I went into what my employees were, it wasn't the same thing. You know, the, the run of the mill laborers running the shingles up and down the roof, just doing the hauling the drywall around. That's not exactly the most reliable guy in the world. And I had to very quickly learn how to manage and become a leader in a realm that I was not accustomed to. And that first house, I lost 40 grand at because I had no idea how to do it. And the fun thing for where I'm at, it's over 97% of the people who do their first flip never do a second one. And part of the reason I am not in that category, because by all rights, I should be, was because I had already bought the second one. So I already was like committed to do it. Mm. And I wasn't losing even more by not even trying on the second product. And then the second one, just everything made up for all the failures of the first one. Very quick learning. This doesn't work. This does work. How to hire people change to the roof. And then, you know, boom, we have ourselves a successful business. Fast forward, the rental agency, which is what we were going for, survived COVID, got enough units. And basically I could do nothing and be, never be heard. I don't think that that's an appropriate way to live life, but that's what can happen if you build a business successfully. You can use it to give you time. And I just think that that from an individual standpoint, that that's a disservice to everyone else. Because I know for a fact, salespeople will heal the world and I want to help that happen. So you, you, how long ago did you start in sales? My first sales job was when I was 18 selling Cutco cutlery. Hey, I'm a college kid. Here's sharp knives. Let's do stuff. Yeah. And so, so basically you, you go to like trade shows, you go to like Costco, shit like that. <laughs> like I, I, I actually it was even harder than that. It was all in people's kitchens. And then after I basically was selling, it was selling so wrong, by the way, this was 1960s sales 101. I'm going to make you feel guilty. You're going to be forced to buy these. And then at the end, I'm going to make you give me all your friends. And then I'm going to rinse and repeat. Like the, all the people that salespeople are icky and, and like, I just don't want to be that. That was this job. And unfortunately, because it's kind of like the kind of gig that everyone gets exposed to, it's the the number one thing people are, ex are exposed to. So they think that, that everything's like that. But successful salespeople know we don't force people into bad situations. We invite them into good situations. And that's why I know salespeople will heal the world. Yeah. And, and what uh, so what were some of the key things that you took away or learned or maybe bad habits? You're like, I'm not going to do that anymore from that first sales position. Well, certainly the high pressure stuff. The... the, yeah. the the not valuing other people, essentially. And then that was articulated in a lot of different ways. Time, essentially respect. Um, you know, you, part of the gimmick was you would tell people it was only a 15 minute show or presentation when you knew it an hour and a half. Yeah. So that's a starting point of a lie. And then the whole thing was just built to create more and more pressure. Sure, there were some ooh and ah moments. At one point I had these scissors that cut up a penny um, you know, you cut through any piece of fruit on the planet, but in reality, it was the entire thing was almost designed like boiler room. And I knew it was wrong. I knew it wasn't going to work, but again, I was good at it and I fell in love with the commission lifestyle. So I essentially taught myself how to do the presentation better in a way that was more honest that helped me sleep at night. And it was all because I like knowing the fact that I'm making more than everyone else around me. And it's strictly based upon what am I doing? It's not like, oh, someone else needs to like me so I get promoted. And that was always my, when I was, you know, 18, early 20s, that was always my biggest fear. No one's ever going to like me. I'm never going to get promoted because I say things people don't want to hear and I'm going to become a pariah. And I know people who were like me that that happened to. Um, they were older than me, but I seen that. I was like, I'm not going for that. I need something where I can control my own destiny. And that was one of the great allures of the commission lifestyle. There's no real promotion from once you have the ability to sell the product, it's how good are you at doing it? You know, the only promotion is, do I go somewhere else to sell someone else's product? But it's, are you good enough or are you not? Let's make stuff happen. And that's what I loved about it. And that's what got me in. But I saw like, you remember Toll Time? You remember that show back in the day? Tool time? How, yeah. Yeah. How Tim Taylor did every single thing wrong and you knew it was wrong. You didn't even need Al to come tell you this is the way you're supposed to do it. Just yeah. from watching Tim do it. 
that was my first three sales managers at Cutco. And then both of the two that I fell into life insurance before I left. Um, like every single thing that you do not want to be. And that was part of why I was like, you know, I'm out. Like, like I'm just, first off, the company's fairly at a corporate level, but I'm not staying in this individual office anymore. Yeah. And I remember getting recruited essentially once I internally declared that I'm not doing this anymore by all kinds of other different companies that sell the same thing because my numbers were there. Obviously I have the legal ability to do it, which at the time people weren't able to pass the series seven, which is like, it's a pest. Yeah. But it's not like it's the end of the world guys. Like, come on. Um, and also take the seven instead of the six, you get so much more power with it. Um, but at any rate, no one could do it. So I was like, I was the, the, the hot girl at the party and everyone wanted me. And I was like, I don't want to be at this party. And, and I, I'm really glad that's why I did leave to go create my first business. Even though I had no idea what I was doing, I just knew, I knew how to sell. I mean, that, that's all I knew. I knew how to sell and that was it. And the rest well, of it took care of myself. When it comes to building a business or even owning a business, there's, there's two, um, two, two traits, two skills you got to work on. That's sales and leadership. Boom. That's mm -hmm. it. Like, exactly. like if, you, yeah. if you work on those two, you're going to be successful. Uh, and both of those center around influence, mm -hmm. the ability to influence people. Can you influence people that you lead to do the job and do it well, right? To sell the idea of what you're, of what you're creating mm -hmm. or, or can you influence people to buy your product or your service? You know, can you, can you sell them on the idea of what that product's going to do for them in their life? Right. It all has to do with influence. Yeah, exactly. And some people will hear that conversation and say, you guys are just like used car salesmen. You're forcing people to do something. They that's manipulation. Do. Yeah. That's not it at all. That's I mean, the, what it is, is it's, it's truly relating to your client yeah. and saying, Hey, what's really going on in your life right now? Is my solution going to work for you or not? Yeah. And if it is, we're, we're making it happen. If we're not, you're not my client. That's cool. We're, I'm just going to go talk to someone else. And that is notion that I, I really was trying to like, let people know and overcome, you know, true sales is having a relationship with someone else. So is being a leader and a manager of a company. It's mm -hmm. having a relationship with the other side and saying, are we able to maximize this? Am I able to create a, a culture in a quick span here that says, hey, we're gonna talk about some things that you might not even know that bother you, but we're gonna bring them out in this conversation. And as a result, even if I'm not the person you end up buying from, you're gonna be better off. And you go through that process successfully Oh, does life get better? Because you you become the trusted asset. Mm -hmm. If you sit down and say, hey, I'm not trying to say what you're doing is wrong or anything like that. I just want to know what happens to you if this doesn't get solved. And, and this doesn't matter if this is a business to business or a business to consumer sale. You're talking to the purchasing agent and say, hey, you're a steel company. You need this iron ore. I get that. On the surface, you could just easily, as a salesperson, I write you a quote, I can give you this much, this is our price. If you want us, take us, cool. That's the equivalent of people who spam your inbox, try creeping your DMs on LinkedIn. Like who wants that? You throw enough bullets, eventually you'll hit something, but it's not really good or successful in the long run. But rather, if I can talk to that purchasing agents and find out you know, your company wants you to be able to provide consistent volume. So that way your, your supply line doesn't get messed up. Cool. What happens if it does? What does that mean to you? And now you're going to get the personal answer from him and find out whether or not he's a client that you want. You know, if my supply line gets messed up, not only do I pay less and I get yelled at like crazy, but we end up having to cut off the workforce for 30% that week. Like, I, I can't have that on my, like, okay, well, we need to make sure we're able to provide, you know, the quantity for you. Quant is quantity the most important thing or is there more going to it? And then, you know, each client's gonna have different answers. Some of them just wanna have less, but it needs to be the best in the world. Some people just need to have a lot so they can just keep working. But you're gonna find that out. And then also you need to have the knowledge of what can your company actually deliver. Um, 
because there's a lot of salespeople out there that have a disconnect from being able to have the conversation, exchange the promises, and then not have their company deliver. Uh, there's really one of two reasons that happens. Either A, your salesperson blatantly lied, or your processing department didn't step up like they're supposed to. Either way, it's not acceptable. It's one of the things I hated about selling life insurance, by the way, was I got this commission check, I got you to buy it, and then some person who doesn't care or know says you're not healthy enough to get this price. Yeah. Sale just died for absolutely no reason. Because I'm looking at the person, they look fine. But for whatever reason, we haven't had enough people in the C group of health category. Your client is the one only chosen. Well, all right, that's another reason I'm not working here. Um, so if you're able to deliver and your company consistently fails on delivering on the back end of their promises, don't waste your time with them, no matter how much they're paying with you. Someone else will pay you enough for your system. You know, at the end of the day, we're all on commission, at least all the successful ones are. So go do something with a company that's not going to give you headaches and grind you into the ground because there's nothing more infuriating than losing a sale because of something that's your company's fault. And, you know, this might not be the happiest news for someone to hear, especially if you're the business owner of that company. But the reality is, is step up or your best kind, your best salespeople are going to step out and they should. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, I will caveat obviously with those financial or in life insurance. So, um, you know, for, for the you life insurance agents watching that are part of the company, Hey, just go with the right carrier. All right. So <laughs> go with the right care. That takes some underwriting knowledge. So understand your client. However, I see where you're coming from. Um, so you, you did sales for a while. What got you into coaching? How'd you get into that? COVID long story short. Um, it really hit me hard when I was told my business didn't matter. I live in Pennsylvania. We were what the fifth hardest shutdown state by some metrics. Some metrics were eighth, whatever. Long story short, was not awesome. And it really bothered me that A, I had to bring my company through hell for government decisions. But also there were a lot of people around me that weren't able to figure it out and were dying. And I started to help them succeed. And that's what got me into coaching was too many of my friends in an array of industries were seeing their lives, their business life being taken away from them. And that was not okay with me. And so and your, your coaching focus around other, other business. Yeah, our, my coaching solves two primarily problems. Yeah. Either a, our sales department is not where it should be for whatever reason we fix that. And the other one is that our business culture is not where it should be. And I want to figure out how to improve that specifically in a way that doesn't involve me as the business owner cutting bigger checks. That's where we help people a lot because no matter which side of that problem you're looking at, sales are not where they should be or the business culture is where it should be. Eventually your business is going to be drugged down by that anchor. And that anchor is going to cause your business to stall out and sputter. And anyone who has been there knows that pain of that constricting crunch that just comes around you of that stress and you don't know why and you don't know how to fix it because at some point you're so far in there and the python has ripped your arms off and you're done i come in here and i take that all away i take that anchor off of you i take that stress out and i allow companies to breathe and become successful again so we okay. do that again through business culture and through sales enhancement okay that makes sense um, and you, you, how did you start speaking? Talk about your speaking uh, career. So when I was in college, I was an all-American debater. <laughs> and whenever I was doing all of the presentations, as you mentioned before, one of the things at Cutco, I'd be at trade shows. I mean, it just kind of just started. You know, I love doing the presentation side of the life insurance conferences. I, I just love doing them. What got me out of life insurance was actually going to other people's conferences Initially, I thought I was going to buy clients. You know, I go up on stage. I talk about how awesome the annuity is. All of these landlords are going to instantly buy it because why wouldn't they? It's the greatest thing ever. And I'm actually sitting in the back of them, and they did the opposite sale on me. As I'm sitting around looking here, it's like virtually every guy in here is working less hours than me. They have a happier life than me, and they're basically making the same amount, if not more than me. What the hell am I doing wrong? Oh, that was how I got taken out of life insurance to go into the world of becoming a landlord and a flipper. And then from there, like I said, everything else spun out. But 
what got me into speaking was I always did it and always liked it. And I just needed to figure out that gear of how to do it professionally. And it was shortly after I realized that, hey, COVID is here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but these problems exist in other states and pretty much the populated ones. Why don't I figure out how I can help people in a way that I can? And at the time we started digitally. I mean, there was no other option. I mean, I couldn't get on a plane. So we just started talking to people through the internet and we did one-on-one sessions. And then one-on-one sessions came to talk to my whole sales department, which then came to talk to more and more and more. And the next thing you know, I'm logged in and 15 other people are there to see me at a webcam with this some background behind me. So that's what happened. And I, it, it kind of just grew organically. I already liked presenting and talking. I already knew what I was talking about. I mean, it's not like I just look at and goes, this is how you sell. 15 companies to show I know how to do this. So, you know, it, it was, it was organic, you know, without a better way. I just kept reaching and reaching and not knowing what I was going to grab, but like a little kid trying to grab things off the kitchen table. Actually, I found something I liked. Okay. I like it. I like it. What are some challenges that you've had? I mean, some like super like, uh, um, you know, career ending potentially Besides the flip, you know, you, you, you lost 40 K what's some real, like, well, I was at 40 K when my net worth was 30 K. I mean, that was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that, that was big, but I mean, I, I think I'm going to be with the same with the majority of people out there. I did not deal well at all. I mean, at all when they told me I was unessential and that I didn't matter. And like that was a, a, a major thing. And, and in all honesty, I don't, if I didn't have the ability to help other people, I, I don't know if I still would have these businesses. I, there's a strong chance I would just sold them and run away, gone somewhere warm and be on a beach. But um, it was really through helping my clients, helping, helping the people around me that got me out of this. But COVID, and being told that I didn't matter for lack of a better word and that my employees and my clients don't matter by extension. That, uh, that was a lot. Um, I've all, I've owned a kegerator for a long time. Uh, it's one of the great ways I save money. You know, you buy a keg, you get seven and a half cases of beer for the price of four. It's pretty quick math, how much you save. Um, during COVID, I probably went through them about six times faster than, than before. And that was the beginning part of COVID. I mean, once I got into the coaching, you know, life returned back to normal, at least as normal as it could. But I mean, that was, that was, that was the challenge, man. I mean, I, I did not deal with being told that I didn't matter well at all because all of the evidence of my life, anytime I had a product, I fixed it. And I fixed it by building a relationship with someone else. Mm. And now I was told that I wasn't allowed to see anyone. And on top of it, I was the problem because that was how they sold it in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, man. That, that was what March madness of 19, almost exactly three years ago or whatever it was a couple of weeks off. Dang. It was a three, maybe four years ago now, but yeah. Um, so, so now that you, you, you got all this sales experience, you create your own mm -hmm. company, you realize that you, there's more things you want to do. You get into coaching, you get into public speaking, you have all this, what's your plans? How, are you looking to scale? How do you want to change your business looking into the future? Well, I love, first of all, I love where it's at. Um, yeah. So I, I, I want to grow it in the sense that I, that I get more exposure. And the, one of the ways I did it, which I will be debuting, actually will be out by the time that this starts, is I've never done a European sale before. And I got recruited by a European satellite country to now have create a flagship company for them where I'm going to be their prime time slot, 7 p.m. at each respective time zone on Thursday night, having conversations similar to this, teaching people how to become better at life and at sales. Those are, I mean, exactly what you said, the essence, leadership and sales, that's what I am and what I bring to the table. So. I'm long story short, I'm going to kind of do the same thing that I've done my whole life. I'm going to just dive in, learn how to swim, 
because I've never not. Yeah. And that's probably a really scary thing. But once you have the skills of knowing how to relate to someone and how to sell, it doesn't matter what water you're in. This game, this life is about building relationships with others. That's the one thing as a species, all of us are built to do. And if you can do that and reutilize these skills over and over again, well, next thing you know, you can go anywhere. So long story short was, I'm going to be gra- drastically increasing my exposure. And I don't know, may- maybe I'll be learning a, a, a middle of Europe language and start doing presentations there. But uh, I, I, I really like the fact that that's how we're broadening it and, and going to be, by default, you have to scale. Because if you, once you expand into that bigger of a new market, you just scale. And the way that I do my business culture, um, I know that it will work because I don't do it the way everyone else does it because I know it doesn't work. So why, why keep repeating just because it's easy? Yeah. Uh, and so one of the things I like to want to kind of hone in on and magnify is the concept of, you know, you talk about like, hey, I'm just going to jump in, learn how to swim. And, and, you know, that's what I've always done. And I think that's a key dip, pivotal kind of piece that separates an entrepreneur from most other people. It's mm-hmm. that it's not that they, they don't have the the ability. Everyone has the ability to be adaptable. The human race is adaptable. If we weren't all of us, we wouldn't fucking be here, right? We wouldn't True. we wouldn't be the apex predator. But we are adaptable. That's what sets us apart from all of the other uh, animals on the planet. Um, I, I think it's the fear of adapting. You know, like entrepreneurs don't have that fear. They're like, you know what? I'll figure it out. Like, F it, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to learn along the way. I'm going to jump off the cliff. I'm going to build the parachute on the way down. All these things, it's just because we have something within us or there's something that's happened to us or something where it's just like, we know we'll adapt because mm-hmm. it's human nature. It's within us and everyone has that ability. And there's always that fear that holds a lot of people back from chasing their dreams or doing things they want to do is because that I, I think it's the fear now that I'm thinking about it, that we're having this conversation. It's like that fear of adapting or they, or they don't think they can adapt or they're still, they, they like being in that comfort zone. Right. Uh, That's certainly a lot of it. Um, and, and this might be saying the same thing you're trying to say, maybe like a little Venn diagram with a little bit missing, Yeah. but I believe it's the fear of the commission lifestyle. Um, of not knowing I'm going to get paid. Even yeah. if the fact that I paid a hundred times, thousand times X, but there's no guarantee when it's coming in. Like that was one of the things that when I was 18 was scary as hell. I mean, I when we look at the end of the year, I was paid almost twice as much as everyone around me, but I only got paid five times. Everyone else got paid 26 times every other week. Like every other normal job, Friday that check comes around. Okay, but... I didn't. And there were periods whenever it was like, I, I, I don't know when the next sale's coming and I don't know. And then there's times where it's like, drinks on me, guys. Like, I got all of this. Like, don't worry about it. And and learning that roller coaster of finances, especially when you're that young, was was incredibly vital. But that's part of this. I mean, I think that is the fear of what happens if it it does, it comes back to the same question, what happens if I fail? And I just don't believe that's an option because if you force yourself to dive into a problem hard enough, long enough, and from enough different angles, you'll find a solution or you'll find out that maybe the best thing for me to do is just not deal with this problem because I found 13 other opportunities that are better off for me. Because that's the other thing that happens. You know. There's some businesses that just shouldn't exist. And it's like, this was a bad idea. It's not going to work in this market. Okay. That doesn't make you a bad person. That just says you had an idea, you went for it, and it didn't happen. But in that process, you're going to learn skills. And are you going to use those skills to use the next idea and make it better? Or are you just going to run away and hide? And that's the difference between entrepreneurs that last or maybe are lasting on their second or third one versus ones that never come back. I mean, you see this a lot with chefs, you know, world-class training, they're amazing at stuff, but their first kitchen fails. How many of them just sign up to be the JV chef somewhere else? And how many of them say, you know what, I'm gonna go figure out how to get financing. I'm gonna go figure out how to get investors. I'm gonna open up a new shop. And the next thing you know, boom, 
It's amazing. You know, it, it happens in every line of work. I just pick chefs because we eat their food and we can think of them better. Um, but it's it's something that's out there and real. And it's, do you want to step up or do you want to run away and hide? And there's no shame in it. I mean, it's scary not knowing if you're ever going to get paid again. You start having these self-doubt questions. Am I good enough? Is it me? Like, what, what is the problem? And if you go through objectively and look at every single problem in a realistic fashion, you'll get those answers. And that is one of the hardest skills as people, entrepreneurs included, you have to get from. And Marvel just gave us a great example of that for those who have seen the Doctor Strange movies. When he gets punched out of his body and he's just kind of hovering there and he's able to observe the world outside of his body, that's what we really are talking about here. If I'm looking at this situation and my personal feelings and me was not involved, just person A and person B, is this connection appropriate, respectable, all those good things, or is it not? And take out your personal emotion of what you intend and what they intend, just based upon what's actually happening, acceptable or not, black and white, green check or red, X, what are we doing here? That will really, that skill, it's hard to do. It's hard to very much say that very, I have the problem. It's very, hard to, it's very hard to remove the emotion. That's the, I think that's another piece of it is removing the emotion, seeing things from a logical standpoint and mm -hmm. just looking at the facts and looking at the metrics and the data. Um, exactly. We're, and that's what the fear is. Fear is the emotion features. in the room. Yeah. yeah. So, well, Joe, I appreciate you jumping on and sharing a little bit your sales and sharing about what you're, what you have going on. If anyone wants to learn more about you, gets maybe coaching, uh, look at any of your sales. I don't know if you have like sales training that you offer to people or, we do. um, and they want to learn more. What's the best way to connect with you? Elite business conversations.com. That's elite business conversations.com. Since this episode will be coming out in the second half of the year on there, you also will be finding my first and brand new best selling book. You'll be able to get access to there. And that is the story of how, Right during that first split we mentioned here before, where I thought I was going to sell and make all this money, I made a trip plan that I was going to arrive in Las Vegas with my friends who had real jobs. I had 500 bucks worth of cash, 250 bucks left of credit. That's how stretched thin I was at the time. And how I used my sales skills on the Las Vegas sales floor to not only cover my whole trip, which we spent every single cent we could have, I ended up spending over six grand. How I did all that, just using sales skills on the on the casino floor. I'm not going to say which one because I want to go back there. Um, but it's amazing. And like I said, you'll be able to get that book there on my website at EliteBusinessConversations.com. Um, like I said, it, it, it's already starting as a pre-sold number one bestseller. So we hope that you guys enjoy it as well and come check us out. Awesome. Awesome, man. Last question I have all my guests is if you have the opportunity to sit with, learn from, have a conversation with, break bread with any three individuals in history, alive or deceased? Who would those three be and why? George Washington, because he George. knew the stakes of his problems. He had every reason to quit and he won. Yes, Washington is, is first on that list and there's not really even a debate about that. Um, I mean, obviously, you'd be a jackass. If you I didn't love. Say Jesus. I, by the way, just side note, a lot of people don't know history very well. Like, but uh, he did not want to do a second term. In fact, he didn't initially. They had to come and ask him. They like begged him to come back and do a second term because they truly believed that this was a service. Like, to serve in the government was a service. You you had a career. You did something separate. You left it to go serve the people, and then you went back to your career. That was mm -hmm. what they, because there, there should not be, the power was for the people. It was not to the government. It's amazing how much it changed at the start of World War. Uh, but that's really where it did change. But that's mm -hmm. a side story. Uh, a little Woodrow Wilson tidbit for everyone. <laughs> but, um, you know, number two, I mean, obviously, Jesus has to be on the list. You can't not pick him. Um, he'd be a jackass if he didn't. Um, so that gives me one left of all time. Um You know, I would almost like to see it for the Tim Taylor way of Kennedy because he did so many things wrong. Yeah. 
but still everyone loves him. Even in despite of all of this woke era and knowing everything he did wrong, he is still 100% beloved. He might be the best PR man in history. Um, and I, I would like to kind of find out how that worked. Because um, you can object fly a lot of things he did. None of them really end up on the good side of the ledger, except for one speech he gave. Yeah. Um, then obviously him dying is not good, but that's what he's remembered for. Texas beat Rice, and we're going to the moon, and then driving down the street. But aside from that, everyone else forgot about every single thing that he did wrong, both in the realm of politics and out. And it's a big list. Um, so, I, you know, for, for, for the, the, the two good and one bad, I think that would be the answer. Nice. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for jumping on. For those of you watching, if you watched another, then I know you got value. So do me a favor. Do Joe and I a favor. We ask that you just share this content with another person that can also learn and grow and expand their mind from it. Maybe you can get some sales lessons and leadership lessons from Joe's conversation. Takes you 30 seconds, 60 seconds to rate, review, subscribe, share, but it means the world to both Joe and I, and you can check out his new book. So go check it out. Do the right thing. This has been Be The Difference Podcast. My, my name is Greg Birch, your host. Until next time, we'll see you.